of the situation of the world we are living today, I thought it will be most appropriate to recite an incantation to word of evil spirit. The incantation is called Kitung Rumakso Eng Wangi, the song guarding at night. For anyone who can sing the song, please join me. I hope this will work if you unmute your, uh, uh, and you unmute and then you song, uh, sing along. I'm not sure whether the Zoom will permit uh, you to do that or not. We'll see. Oh, <laughs> Wangi Teko ayu Luputo Eng Loro Luputo Pilai Kape Jem setan kata kurun pada luhan tan ono wani miwah anggawe Allah guna nipong lupo Keni ataman terdo maling ado dan ono ngarah reng mami kuno tutukan seno. All right. I would like to, to thank the uh, 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 director of Nusantara Art of Pablo Gamlan, Matt Dunning, for inviting me to, uh, to talk this time. I am also happy to know that the collection of donations is going well. Uh, to colleagues, Gamlan teachers, students, friends, uh, terima kasih, Maturnwon. Thank you for how should I say Zoom coming out tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and for the sake of clarity, I will be speaking slowly. As many of you know, when I came to this country, I spoke broken English with so much difficulty. Now I still speak broken English, but without any difficulty whatsoever. <laughs> this is just, I just wanting to uh, know what Zoom life, life is like. Uh, originally, I'm going to talk about the history of Gamelan using material I usually used as an interlude in my teaching Gamelan at Wesleyan with Mr. Harjito and also in my course called Music and Theater of Indonesia. Uh, however, the very interesting presentations and discussion in this form by Mas Midianto, Mas Phil, Mas Peter, and Mas Matt, I don't know, I hope all of you are there, has compelled me to link my talk uh, to some points of their presentations. Don't worry, I'm going to, I'm not going to put you on the spot. 
I like very much Mas Mityanto's point about the intimate relationship between rasa and the division and progression of three act in Wayang performance. There had been many studies on the influence of Indian culture on Japanese cultural tradition and performing art. Hypothesis on the influence uh, of the concept of Indian rasa on Japanese rasa in Gamelan is one of such studies. I won't go there for now. I'm still in the middle of reading and writing about it as part of my large research, my drafting a book uh, tentatively entitled Linking the Past and Staging the Present in Japanese Performing Art. The point is that uh, because of the prevalent presence and adaptation of Indian culture in the early centuries of Java, we cannot avoid to try understand about this Java-India encounters. I also enjoy listening the discussion on the question of the purpose of teaching Gamelan for college students. First of all, let me say that I like the variety ways Gamelan teachers teaching Gamelan in the United States and elsewhere. From my perspective, teaching Gamelan falls into two general aspirations, namely product-oriented and process-oriented approaches. Mas Mithi's answer to the question seems to lean on the former, the product-oriented approach, that is for students to be able to keep a concert at the end of the semester. But wait a minute, Mas Mithi. Uh, I think you are, your answer is too modest because in your answer, you said clearly and succinctly that you explain to your student the importance of the concept of responsive and interactive in Gamelan playing. This is the key term from Asmiti, responsive and interactive in Gamelan playing, right? Listening to kendang or punang from any transitions, playing delayed kenong and gong, and listening from the repub on the ngele, and so on and so forth, in order to understand and realizing rasa. So after all, Mas Miti does not teach students only to produce cancer, but through the process-oriented teaching approaches, he impart knowledge about rasa, about way of life. Now, uh, uh, Mas Phil, uh, uh, I enjoy very much a presentation delivered by a native of Coventry, Connecticut. Uh, that's, I think, Mas Bill was born in Connecticut. The video recording of Palaran as illustration of the talk is very helpful. You can listen and see clearly when the drum leads the irama of the serpakan to slow down, then syrup silence when you can see slentum drop out followed by uh, a palaran featuring the singing of mozopat by a solo female or male singers it reminds me my first public lecture of at the art center in jakarta in late 70s but the illustration was even better it was a live performance by my colleagues and teacher at ASCII, now called ISI, and perhaps that was the best public lecture I have ever given in Indonesia. During the discussion, there were a number of questions about Palaran, including the question of its origin, the use of Mozopat, that is the poetic text in Palaran, the meaning and origin of motopat and so on and so forth. 
These questions are historical questions. Since evidence about the genesis of Palaran and Mochopat or the ep historical ep evidence about Gamlan uh, in general for that matter is uh, not that many, it's scanty, not as much as the history of other music like Western music, Indian music, or Chinese music. The discourse on Gamlan history oh. falls in what might be called discursive mode of interpretation. What one ought to do in this circumstance is to gather as many references as one can find from traditional as well as conventional historiography. Regarding Mochopat, uh, the this preeminent language professor Purpo Saroko mentioned, Purpo Saroko mentions its origin in the 17th century. But then I found this uh, book by Thomas Stanford Raffles, the British colonial, colonial governor of Java in the early 19th century. In his book, History of Java, uh, listed more Motopat than 11 Motopat we know them today. Uh, the, uh, there was Kambu, Maskumambang, Kinanti, Asmorondono, Dandangkulo, Sinom, Pangkor, Durmo, Mijil, Puchung, and Makadro, and that's the Mochopat that we know today. The la, uh, the, uh, uh, each of them, according to Raplus, which I, I assume that he got the information from musician and singer in Java at that time, each of the Mochopat can be sung in a number of styles. Palaran style is one of them. However, we don't know if Palaran was meant to be sung like Palaran as we know it today. Uh, namely in the solo singing accompanied by a reduced size gamelan ensemble as explained very well by uh, Maspil. As far as I know, as far as I know, the form of Palaran is intimately connected to the dance opera called Langendrian, which is known as being created in the mid 19th century at the minor court of Mangkunegaran in Surakarta, performed by female dancers who are dancing and singing Palaran. Langendrian reenacts the story of Damar Wulan, the stories associated with the 14th century Hindu Japanese kingdom Mojo Pai. Now I uh, need to share with you the, uh, the next thing. So let me see. <laughs>
is enough to give you an, an idea of what Langendrian is like. So singing and dancing, uh, it's, a, it's a challenge for the dancer, the fact that they have to dance as well as singing. Uh, so now uh, I just want to uh, stay with that uh, image because I, I know I see myself in the corner. <laughs> so back to uh, Mochopat, since each Mochopat is presented not as a poetic reading, but as sung poetry or the poetry are intoned, therefore each of them imparts a certain kind of mood or characters. Information upon the character of each Mochopat can be found in uh, Harjo Viroko's book, uh, uh, written in 1950s, I think 52, entitled Pato Aning Nyakaraken, The Rule to Sing. I have been interested in the character of each Mochopat uh, uh, in my ongoing work, especially in relation to the mention of Mochopat and Gamelan by Kiai Ustad Ulama, that's a uh, Islamic scholars, teachers, in their dakwah, in their propagation. It's eight o'clock. For example, one of today's well-known preacher, Gus Mubafik, uh, from Sleman, Yogyakarta, explained that Motopat is songs about Sangkan Paraneng Dumadi, origin and destination of life. Then he interprets the meaning of each motopat as they indicate the sequence, the sequence of life. Uh, he said the first song is called Masku Mambang. Why is it called Masku Mambang? It means the floating. Kumambang is mean floating of the soul as it descends to the world. Because masku mambang means the descending of the soul after the soul is residing inside the body for nine months, then people should experience the song michil. Michil mean, means coming out. After the baby was coming out, that it was born, was michil, it becomes young boy. The song for this is kinanti. The boy should be given guidance through the guidance through mean kanti, uh, religion and ethics. So this uh, explanation of from Kusmuwafik has something to do with what is called jarwa dosa, which means imposed uh, meaning of the word uh, uh, in order to get the meaning that he want to. Uh, in part. So I'm interested on this, uh, what you might call intertextuality. I'm looking at uh, the meaning of multi-part from different uh, eras, from different authors, uh, in order for me to uh, understand this, the flow of the history of uh, performing art in general. Okay, the next one is uh, uh, Peter, he's a Wesleyan alum, Peter Ludwig. Uh, uh, Mas Peter discussion was expanded to the question of religious connection and the status of Gamlan maker and other things. So let me first mention about the earliest, earliest reference I found so far is from the book of History of Java by Raples, Raples again, and a Dutch official in Grese, his name is Cornet de Groot. Uh, he wrote his report in 1852, mentioned the importance of Grese in East Java near Surabaya the, as the principal manufacturer of gamelan instruments. In my previous work, I made a point about lively cultural performances in Grese 
and Surabaya in the 18th-19th centuries. However, the Khrut did not provide provide us any detailed information about the process of making gamelan instrument. But I have a, a, some photo from, that's a gamelan from Gresik, probably from 18th, 19th century. You can see on the Ban Punang with a very tall gender as Gambang, probably Saron and Temung. Um, I don't know if there's Temung. And uh, well, I think it's two punangs already, yeah. And the gongs, a pair of gong. Uh, uh, and then you can also see in the uh, probably 18th, 19th century, uh, Chorobalan uh, in the Gamelan uh, uh, you hear in the opening of this program, uh, Chorobalan. I think it's this Chorobalan, uh, let me see. Yes, Chorobalan. But it's a different kind of Soropal. And I think you can find this in Gresik, in Madura. In more, it's also possible that Soropal uh, has something, it has connection with uh, uh, Balinese uh, music, uh, processional uh, music. Um, there's another picture there, uh, the bigger picture. It has a, a, a rebab as well, small, uh, probably cheap blown drums. Um, yep, there's a, a, again a very uh, high uh, height of the Kender. Um, so, uh, so I, I, I said that the Khrut uh, did not, does not explain about the detailed information about Gamelan making. The earliest and most detailed information about gamelan making is a report by German authors Jacobson and Van Hasselt. Uh, it is about gamelan making in Semarang in around 1900, focusing on the detailed practical aspect of making gong. In relation to the question of religious dimension of gamelan making, this report mentioned that the first and second leader of the gamelan maker assumed the name Panji. Panji is a prince and the main figure of an indigenous Japanese story originated from East Java. Uh, let me see if I can get the I think this is the picture from 1900 of the gamelan making in Semarang. And you can see the Panji is the one who uh, uh, maneuver the gongs while in the uh, heat of the char, uh, uh, they put it in the char charcoal heat on the fire. Uh, uh, the late Andy Toth, who translated this essay into English, added a footnote on this, stating that Mangkunegoron the seven explained to Yapkuns that each of the crew of Gamelan making assumed the name of Panji and his brother, sister, and Antorat. So the question is why Panji, uh, they, they assume the name of Panji from the Panji story. This is because Gamelan making is the act of dangerously powerful forces involved, especially with metal. Hence, the maker had to assume the names taken from the indigenous Japanese story as a pretend that the Gamelan maker are heroic figures. So similar to this process of making keris, the maker must carry out certain practices of self-denial, such as fasting, meditation, and so forth. And offering and certain ritual must be done. Mas A.L. Swarti happens to be teaching Gamelan at Wesleyan this semester, Zoom teaching. <laughs> he is not only Gamelan teacher and performer and composer, but also an expert in tuning and making gamelan. A couple of days ago, 
I talked to him about this because he uh, stay in my house. He said that yes, the name Panji, only Panji, is still being used until today in uh, in reference to the leader of Gamelan maker. He added that there is only one element of Gamelan making which is being modernized, namely replacing traditional pumping device called Lamus with electric blower. Lamus is that pumping device to sustain the strength of the charcoal fire for heating up the would-be instrument. Now, mass math presentation. I mentioned a bit during his talk about the myth behind Srimpi Munsar, its significance is in projecting the 18th century Japanese life in globalized context. There are a number of versions of the story. The common one goes like this. A powerful Chinese princess at Aningar heard from Chinese traders that there was a prosperous kingdom of Kuparman ruled by a very powerful and wise king, Wong Agung Mena. Based on that news, she fell, she fell in love with Wong Agung Mena and wanted to be his wife. So she went to Kuparman with a large armada a fleet and many thousand uh, uh, in Torats and forces. When she arrived in Kuparman, she heard that Wong Agung Mina was in the middle of battle with the kingdom of Kailani, whose forces was led by, by a powerful princess, Kelaswaro. But Kelaswaro forces lost the battle. She was then taken as a bride by Wong Agung Mina. So she became the uh, wife of Wong Agung Mina. Of course, Abdanengar was very upset. So she challenged Kelaswaro for a battle, ending up with the death of Abdanengar. So it is interesting that Japanese dance master, inspired by this myth, composed Srimpi Munchar portraying a stylized, stylized duel of these two princesses, but being performed by four dancers, each pair represents these two princess, princesses. I'm not a dance expert. I don't know. I don't have any good explanation. Uh, most of the program notes is usually very brief. What I learned from this kind of dance, uh, Srimpi, Bedoya, and others, is that the dance does not literally serve to express actions or emotions. What they, what the spectators enjoy is that the dance movement present the inner character of the dramatic heroes and villains. So you can notice this in Srimpi Munchar, but you will also be able to identify different costumes of the dancers, the different costumes between Chinese princess and Japanese princess, and subtle difference in their movement. I think I'm going to go to the next uh, things, uh, right? Uh, and this is the Munsar.
so uh, I'm, I would like to get back to Mas, uh, Matt's uh, video uh, uh, because I'm, I noticed that in the blurb of his video, Mas Matt video, uh, you include this sentence, quote, while highlighting themes of love and morality, Srimpi Munchar is also sexually explicit. Hello, Masmed. <laughs> we want to know about this. <laughs> uh, uh, well, it turned out that there is another person of the story which uh, contains a very fascinating episode. Uh, the story goes like this. Princess Ataningar was so powerful, she even can disappear from the side. So powerful was she that she was able to kidnap Wong Akung Mena, bring him to hide in a cave. There, two of them alone in the cave, at Daningar tied Wong Agung Mena, and in many different ways, she expressed her deep of love to him, torture Wong Agung, Agung Mena, whipping him, and you can imagine yourself what else that different ways uh, consist of that is uh, how Ataningar uh, teasing uh, Wong Agung Mena inside the cave by themselves. So I thought that's interesting. That might be what the sexual explicit that uh, Matt's uh, referring to. Uh, okay, now I think we'll get to the uh, scatten. Uh, earlier, I mentioned about Gerse as important place for the production of Gamlan. From sources I have read, I learned that Gamlan making before the 19th century can be found along the north coast area from Banyuwangi up to Cirebon. So, in Banyuwangi, Propolinggo, uh, of course, Gerse, Jeporo. Uh, Semarang, as you see seen from until this is until uh, 1900, uh, going uh, Blora, I think it was at Cirebon, uh, probably Tegal as well. So um, the question then is, uh, I think I should give uh, uh, give you another picture, of, right? So uh, this is a. Uh, uh, an image from, I think it's from 17th century in Banten. Uh, again, the uh, coastal area there, Banten, where uh, the uh, gongs of different size. It look like uh, probably like Chorobalen or Kodok or uh, Monggang. Uh, it's uh, it, uh, the drawing of probably uh, European traders, so it's not very good drawing. But you can see actually uh, the, the, the uh, gong has a knob. Uh, you can see here knob, and there's a there's another uh, uh, flat gong, standing gong like a sort of balen, or, and then probably this one is a uh, kender up in there, uh, and then the dancers. You can see also the dancer nine of them, and then there's a kender upper there. So this is from 17th century Banten. Well, and this is very small uh, uh, image here, but it's from, I think it's, this is 16th century Tuban. You can see a, a set of ensemble properly, also like a, a sort of balen or something like that. It has a gong up in there, and they have another uh, 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 instrument like a uh, bunang in sort of balen over here, up in there. I'm not sure what this man is doing and this, but of course you can see this is a equestrian horse, uh, horse, or a horse tournament. Uh, 
right? Uh, and you can see also Rafa's uh, a scheme uh, uh, of a gamelan from 19th century. Um, uh, and this is from Bluro with a, a gigantic size of rebab. And the person who playing the rebab is sitting down on the chair. Um, so the question is why the North Coast seem to be the place where the gamelan uh, proliferate, the cultural performing, uh, uh, cultural uh, traditions, uh, uh, performing art is uh, also uh, uh, developed uh, very highly. And so, uh, uh, so that's the question that, um, that probably you will find a little bit of explanation from the Scatan, Matt, you ready with the Scatan, I guess, and then we will have a discussion after the Scatan. On the fifth day of Maulud in the Islamic calendar, a celebration begins in honor of the Prophet Muhammad's birthday. This is Sekaten, a festival best known for the music performances on the immense and powerful Gamlan Sekaten. On this first morning, a procession starts at the front gates of the court or Kraton. Dozens of the Kraton servants, the Abdidalam, are carrying these antique instruments of bronze and wood, which comprise two complete Sekaten gamelans. Here in Surakarta, their path leads from the Kraton through the streets and temporary market stalls to their destinations, the Great Mosque. It is believed that one of the Gamlan Sekaten originated during the early period of Islam in Java, probably in the 16th century. This Gamlan was invented by Islamic religious leaders known as the Wali. Their intent was to attract the Javanese, most of whom were still Hindu, to the mosque via the popularity of Gamlan music and thus promote their conversion to Islam. The Wali chose to construct gamelan that were larger and thus louder than other gamelan to ensure their drawing power from afar. Sekaten is now the only remaining occasion in the year when these sacred gamelans, two times larger than any other gamelan ensemble, are played. It is also believed that by listening to the Gamlan Sekaten, people will be rewarded by Allah in their health, work, and happiness. This is a celebration that will last for eight days at the Great Mosque in the courtyard and open square in front of the mosque, culminating in the Karbuk Maulud, a holiday in honor of the Prophet Muhammad. A crowd has gathered at the mosque, and religious speakers are already busy as the instruments arrive. However, it is still several hours before the first sounding of the gamelan will take place, beginning at about 3 p.m. The gamelan instruments, though still covered, attract the crowd's attention. They are brought to the two pavilions to the north and south sides of the main prayer hall, where they will be played over the coming days. 
The larger and younger of the two gamelan is placed in the south pavilion. It is named Kiai Guntur Madu and was commissioned by the Sultan Pakupon on the port. It is larger and thus lower in pitch than the older gamelan at the north pavilion, named Kiai Guntur Sari. The gamelans alternate their performances with Kiai Guntur Madu in the south pavilion playing first. Formerly, the Gamlan musicians for Sekaten were exclusively members of the Kraton Gamlan. Many still are, but today they are occasionally joined by music faculty and other professional musicians not belonging to the Kraton Gamlan. The instruments are carried inside and placed in their particular configuration. This illustration shows the position of the gamelan instruments in the South Pavilion. The punang, the peduk, the temungs, the sarons, the kempiang, and the gongs. To honor the gamelan and help purify in the space, incense is burned by the gongs, the heart of the gamelan. It is now time to remove the shroud covering the instruments. First, a saron, followed by the punang. There is an inscription on the peduk for Paku Buono the X who ruled the Kingdom of Surakarta from 1893 to 1939. The last to be uncovered are the gongs, the most sacred instruments in the Kamlan. Meanwhile, a steady flow of people start to fill the perimeter of the pavilion, even though it is still more than two hours before the Kamlan will be played. In particular, there are many women who have come early to make an offering. These women receive blessing from flower petals soaked in water and infused with the power believed to emanate from the great gong. They first drink from the water and then receive petals bundled in a banana leaf. The tabu or playing mallets are constructed from wood and the horn of the water buffalo, and just like the Sakat and Gamlan, are much larger and heavier than normal. The boxes contain offerings of food placed in the center of the Gamlan. This is a ritual often accompanied with prayer that will be repeated frequently in the next days, either during a break or when the opposite gamelan is playing. Garlands of flowers decorate and honor the instruments as well. The musicians have arrived and are seated at their instruments. The pavilion is completely filled. Behind the panting of the pavilion hung palm fronts. From somewhere, a signal is given, and at once the crowd grabs for the palms 
believing in the good fortune they may bring. Now the signal is given that the gamlang may play, and the punang player climbs behind his instrument. They are only two or three pieces composed specifically for gamlang skaten. One of these, kending rambu, is always the first to be played. There are several common structural elements that identify Gamelan's katen performance. The first is Ratian, a melody played by the Punang that is somewhat free rhythmically. This melody is interspersed with core melodic notes known as Dawahan from the Temungs and Sarons and accented by the Peduk and Gong. As this introductory Ratian end, the rhythm becomes more stable Curiously, the media show little discretion for the sanctity of this occasion and climbed around the musicians to catch a few shots for evening news. The Kempiang joins in at this point as a pitched rhythmic interpunction, and the Temung, the lead melodic instrument, establishes the tempo and will continue to moderate it throughout. Another characteristic of skaten performance is the sesekan, the climax section which is played faster and louder toward the end of the main composition. In Gamlan Skaten, the sesekan is almost always followed by a gradual slowing down leading to the end of the piece, or suo. The peduk helps control speeding up and slowing down by either anticipating or slightly delaying its speed, respectively. As this opening performance of Rambu comes to an end, one can hear the asar, or call to prayer, already resounding through the courtyard of the mosque and beyond. Offerings are again made as most of the audience disperses, charged with the energy emanating from the powerful Gamlan Skaten. Another call to prayer is heard broadcast from the tower. Here, in the courtyard of the mosque, a number of small vendors have positioned themselves in front of the Gamlan pavilion and in the area between the two buildings. The two items most popular with the vendors are flowers and eggs.
the flowers are used as offerings and the eggs are believed to represent fertility. Other more secular items are also available, including toy whips for the children and various drinks and food. The Gamlan Skaten are performed every day, typically starting around 9 a.m. and ending close to midnight with morning, afternoon, and evening sessions. There are several activities to be found when the musicians are not performing. In the South Pavilion, offerings continue to be made in the vicinity of the Great Gong. Here, a musician takes this moment to repair a tabu, wrapping a thick cotton string around the wooden core of this saron mallet. One of the servants of the kraton is frequently busy with the preparation and serving of tea and food for the musicians. Compositions performed for Kamlan Skaten are typically 15 to 20 minutes long. Due to the size and intensity of Kamlan Skaten, musicians receive quite a workout and welcome the break as the South and North Kamlan alternatively perform. These breaks provide an opportunity for prayer and meditation, or a chance to eat or have a smoke and chat with fellow musicians. The final day of the Skaten Festival is known as the Garbuk Maulut which take place on the 12th day in the month of Maulud. Garbuk is derived from a Japanese word mean a cheering noise of the people. Garbuk Maulud is a holiday to celebrate the Prophet Muhammad's birthday and on this morning thousands of people have collected here in front of the Kraton. Many more are lined up along the streets between the Kraton and the mosque, awaiting the procession that is about to begin. In true Japanese fashion, Garbuk intertwines elements of religious tradition with secular elements derived from the Kraton. At last, the procession begins. Leading this parade are 10 units of the Kraton undercard, dressed in their traditional uniforms. They march to a fife and snare drum, a remnant of the Dutch colonial period. The royal servants return the Kamlan Skaten to the mosque. It had been brought back to the Kraton on the previous night to contribute in blessing the most significant offering of Karbuk Maulut, the four Gunungan. Gunungan literally means mountains, and these large offerings are creations from rice and vegetables decorated with small cakes, palm fronds, chili peppers, and garlands of beans. They are a gift to the mosque from the Sultan Paku Buono the 12th and are prepared for four days prior to the Karbuk Maulud. There are two types of Gunungan offerings, one male and one female in nature. Here is the first Gunungan to appear, the female Gunungan Wadon.
This is the male gunungan, the gunungan lanang. Many more offerings of food also join the procession to the mosque. They are followed by an ancient form of gamelan, the marching gamelan sorobalen. female serpents signal the last of the Kraton serpents in this procession, and everyone struggles to make their way to the mosque. <laughs> Thousands have managed to pack the courtyard of the mosque where the Kunungan will be blessed and religious speakers struggle to be heard above this immense crowd. One by one, the Kunungan will be paraded back into the crowd for what is possibly the high point of this carpet. It is strongly believed that by grabbing the fruits of this Kunungan, one will be rewarded in health, happiness, and fortune by the Almighty Allah. Crowd's eagerness results in an intense yet good spirited free for all as they descend upon these mountains of potential blessings and the Scotland festival draws to a close. Alright everybody, should be enough time to have watched the film, Gift of the Wally, and we're back here in the Zoom with, uh, we're going to have some questions for Pastor Marsan, but first of all, I just want to say that your lecture was so cool. I thought it was so cool how you approached the idea of the history of Gamelan by giving extra information about all the previous lectures, um, because you know more about all this stuff than most of us that have that, that have done these lectures. So we really appreciate it. And if you missed these lectures, I, I put a link in the chat box 
those uh, previous lectures have all been uploaded to YouTube, except for mine so far. Mine's not on there yet. Um, but there's a link to our YouTube channel, and you can subscribe there. I also put a link there to our website that goes directly to the guest lecture series page if you need to visit there and get some more information or make a donation there. Um, so I want to take the first question here because there's a question that I've always had um, that I've never really known the answer to. So I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more or tell us a little bit more about uh, Paku Buono the 10th and maybe why did he uh, put his name on everything in uh, Sikaten and what is his significance in, uh, in, in Indonesian history? Well, I guess Pakubono the 10 is the time when uh, things uh, developing well, uh, media and uh, uh, all different things. Uh, and Pakubono, uh, I know that uh, this Peduk, Peduk uh, on the Skaten is a Pakubono the 10th. So that is probably uh, the restoration of, of it. Um, it's a, I try to think of uh, one story that I, uh, well, I guess it has something to do with the time. Uh, the time when uh, the Indonesia Java is being modernized. If you think about the uh, Kraton Solo, uh, uh, it's all this uh, Bangkunkaran and Kasunanan and in, in Jogja. It's all this actually is a sort of European, uh, uh, being Europeanized electricity. Uh, uh, so I have an image that maybe in the past the Kraton is sort of like a big village rather than uh, 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 glorious uh, halls like uh, uh, what you, we see now. Uh, so it's so much in uh, Western European influence in the Japanese culture in such way that uh, there's kind of, uh, what should I say, a uh, more and more distance between the commoners and the elite. Uh, uh, the Pakupuno, the tense, one of the story, which is very funny because it's, uh, it's coming from my teacher, Pamloyo Widoto. Uh, uh, he seems to, he seems to understand that he knows uh, Pakupuno tennis know everything. Uh, he knows uh, music and things like, uh, uh, who knows. So at a certain point, uh, there was a, uh, Thursday, uh, regular Thursday, gamelan playing, and uh, suddenly he came up from his uh, inner chambers of the Kraton and said, stop, why don't you play Tukong? But actually the musicians at that time was playing Tukong. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's a funny story. But, but again, I think he said, uh, the, his, his, uh, he earned his uh, 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 being famous is, uh, because of the time. Uh, he received all of these uh, guests from Europe, from Thailand. Uh, and so, so which make uh, him uh, it's, uh, uh, one of the well-known uh, uh, king. Thank you. Um, and before I put it over to other questions, if, if people want to yeah. ask some questions, uh, put your name in the chat box so that I can call on you next. I have a couple lined up, so make sure you get it in there. Um, I just want to note, outside of Indonesia, one other question. Um, I, I know of only one other set of Sikatan instruments that exist outside of Indonesia. So that is, um, mm -hmm. uh, Mark Benamo has uh, a set at Erlem College. He has some gigantic Demungs and he has a Bonong Panambung there. So he can play uh, Sakatan style. Um, and actually, we have a dream to bring the Sakatan style to our Gamelan in Buffalo. And someday we can raise the funds for that. But do you know if there's any other place in the world that has these sort of old type of 
types of gamelan outside of the country or is mostly the gamelan we see around the world um, the more modern style of, of full complete gamelan? Yeah, I would say mostly the modern style of gamelan. I don't think, I, I'm not sure uh, what the reason of bringing gamelan skaten <laughs> outside of uh, Java uh, for uh, uh, the function, it's uh, the functionally speaking, is the skaten of course is related to Prophet Muhammad and Islam, and uh, of course you can uh, uh, make regular gamelan into becoming gamelan skaten, so that uh, choosing some of the instrument we did, we did here at Wesleyan because we happen to have a, a punang panembung. Our gamelan is a, a Chinese gamelan and has a gigantic punang panembung, so we can use that punang panembung for skaten. Very cool. All right, so my first question here, and I, I've also turned everybody's video off, so when you have a question, um, you can turn your video back on. Um, and I also, I, I also noticed that uh, 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 Peter and uh, who else? Uh, Maspels, uh, all is there except Masmitianto. I didn't see Masmitianto. <laughs> so I hope that they also can answer some of the questions as well. And I saw some of the uh, 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 my colleagues, uh, friends, uh, Jordi, there, Mark. Mark Berman is there, and yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, the first question I have is uh, from Mr. Sutrisno Hartono. If you would like to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question, it is your turn. Hi, Mastres. Thank you, good evening, Pak Sumarsa, my Hi. professor and my teacher. A long time no see, hope everything's mm -hmm. okay in Wesleyan and your family back in Java? Yes, yes, we are uh, doing good at the hangar down here without going out. And my sister uh, in the village in East Java, I, I, um, probably I have to reveal myself that I'm not, uh, I was born in a small village in East Java. I'm not from Solo or Chukcha. And my sister, uh, I have two older sister, they both is in their 80s, a zero. And they have, I have to wear, uh, even in the small Philips in East Japan, uh, people require to wear masks. Uh, so, uh, so far, uh, I communicate with them, and they're all, uh, uh, my sister and their family is doing well. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Chris and thank you for your excellent presentation. I learned a lot from you and everyone, of course, and Matt, and everyone who participated in this discussion. It's amazing during this uh, bad situation, but we are still sharing very excellent program. I have a question uh, related to the presentation here, and actually my question was actually uh, addressed to uh, Matt long a uh, previous discussions. But I would like to pass on to your as well, Pak Sumarsang. Mm -hmm. uh, after seeing the Sekaten uh, with uh, clear information on that, and thanks for bringing this up, that is very excellent. I was wondering if there is a connection or relations between the Gamelan Sekaten or Serat Mena and the Wayang Gulek Mena in relation also with the form of dance form that you you saw us on the presentations earlier it has a connection with the dakwah or a lecture toward the islamizations of java in the past on the similar way that a missionaries introduced the christianism uh, did on the kronchong or vice versa what is your opinion i would also like if possible to hear from other persons from Western perspective, how you respond to this hybridizations of arts and culture toward what Professor Sumar Sams has discussed in this uh, event. Thank you very much. Okay, Matt, do you want to take it first or? 
Uh, I'll, I'll let you take it. I, I answered <laughs> it in my, a little bit in my previous. So when I upload it, people can go and watch mine. Uh, yeah. But for now, you have all the time. <laughs> oh, okay, well, as I, as I said, that the, of course, it's a, uh, the whole uh, the, the proliferation of Gamelan in the North Coast area has a lot to do with uh, Islam, the Islamization of Java. Uh, these two things is combined together. That is the old tradition from Machopite, and then you have uh, the elite uh, merchants in the North Coast area who uh, make the economy booming in such way that uh, uh, the, uh, the, this combination of old traditions and the money that are available uh, uh, make it possible for the development of, uh, of cultural tradition in general, particularly also Wayang, uh, uh, of different kinds, uh, mask dance, Wayang Kule, and um, with, uh, one of my research topics is actually Wayang Kule in the North Coast area from Batang up to uh, Tegal and Cirebon. Uh, so this is all, it has something to do with the Islamization. Now, the question is then whether uh, uh, well, the, of, of course, it has something to do with the dakwah, the uh, way how uh, uh, the Islamic uh, figure, important figures, uh, usually is, uh, in reference to Wali, uh, it's uh, use the performing art as a way to uh, uh, to spread the Islam. The the issue is, the problem is that it doesn't much evidence, detailed evidence about the Wali uh, uh, has import, had important roles in, uh, in using the performing It's nine o'clock. So uh, I always have to struggle myself uh, in explaining to my colleagues uh, in Indonesia uh, in what way, uh, when what ways Wali used Wayang for dakwah in, say, 16th, 17th century? There's so the, the, the so the only thing I can think of then is uh, Sulu with jails uh, in in from Cirebon in the 17th century, who uh, uh, telling us that Kali Joko performing Wayang and. Uh, the people who come to the Wayang, who, uh, who are coming from the Wayang, they don't have to pay the money, but they only have to recite Sahadat. Uh, so, so that's that's the closest you can think of uh, the evidence. There isn't anything else. What lakon, what story is being performed, and. Uh, in, in what way actually the Wayang is being used to uh, to uh, uh, to influence people to becoming Islam, it's almost uh, non-existent. That is why I sort of start thinking about the today's ulama, today's uh, uh, ustad, today's Islamic teachers who use Wayang for uh, dakwah. Uh, they, of course, they claim this is the way how Wali was doing it. Uh, so my my issue, my struggles on doing this research is how you reconciliate between the belief and the historical evidence. This is difficult things to 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 uh, to. Uh, it, this is a challenge. Uh, if I say, well, uh, actually, I did uh, give a, a talk at the in Solo about uh, we don't have much evidence about Wally's role in uh, in uh, using uh, uh, Wayang for uh, dakwah, and it was being uh, 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 written in Compass Com. And I, I can see 
all sorts of uh, 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 comments from people who reading that compass, uh, uh, how bad I was, I am, <laughs> because I didn't believe that Bali <laughs> uh, uh, has a role in, in these things. So, so this is, I guess this is a problem for anyone who try to uh, think these two, two things, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the challenge is how to uh, explain uh, the belief system and the historical evidence. Uh, so I guess that's uh, still uh, a lot of homework they have to do, and uh, and of course uh, my uh, my ongoing research includes uh, in what way Indian cultures influence uh, Japanese cultures, and um, reading passages from Kakawin and Kavya, which in itself remind my uh, remind me of my own story when I was a student in Solo. Uh, we were uh, we have a a, 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 a class on uh, Bahasa Kawi, old Japanese language, but uh, uh, the teacher was so strict. The, and most of the time, what we're doing is uh, translating Bahasa Kawi to Bahasa Indonesia. And because the teacher was so strict that you had to really exactly the way how he will translate that Kawi to Indonesia. If you don't do it, you might have a, a, a score like a minus sometimes, minus one or minus two. <laughs> so now I this is the time when I have to read all of these passages from uh, uh, Arjuna Vivaha, from uh, Buma Kavya from Bambang Vidya. Fortunately, and there's so many of these uh, uh, old manuscripts is already being translated or uh, into English as well as being uh, written down in Latin, so we can read it. Uh, I have a uh, easier time to do this research. Thank you, uh, Patmarsam. Mm -hmm. um, I have another question here from Ed Luna, if you want to jump in here, Ed. Mm. Thank you um, to Trisna for the great question. So, uh, hi, Pat. So I'm just oh. wondering, uh, going back to your discussion about, um, well, the, the, the Adaningar uh, Kalaswaro uh, yeah. dance and the interactions between Javanese and Chinese so I noticed that in that particular dance, and especially uh, with Jogja style uh, mm. dances that uh, enact this particular scene, uh, that the costumes, the Chinese costumes, aren't necessarily Han style uh, costumes. And they seem to be like more reflective of, let's say, minority groups uh, in Southwestern mm. China. Mm -hmm. So right around the area where the Hokkien's uh, originally settled and maybe like the some of the ethnic groups uh, mm -hmm. surrounding them, like the Hmong, the Mian, especially if you go to Jogja, um, I believe uh, the Adang, uh, Adadingar uh, character, I believe she has like these coins, like a coin filled mm -hmm. headdress. And that to me strikes me as, oh, this is like uh, ethnic group Chinese because a lot of those ethnic groups in uh, southwestern China do have this type of uh, headdress. So I'm just wondering if you have any more comments on that. Well, not really. I, uh, um, what I'm doing now actually is uh, uh, not going that far to really uh, make a connection between the Chinese tradition uh, what kind of uh, costumes, thing like that. What I'm doing now is really reading Yosotipuro's uh, book uh, from 18th century. Uh, there's about, I don't know, it's more than nine Yosotipuro's uh, uh, writing and Surat Mena uh, 
uh, it's called Surat Mena, I think 910 or something like that. And Mena Cino, there's a five volume of Mena Cino, uh, which I sort of summarize a little bit uh, in my talk. Uh, so that's so far I can do now. I don't have uh, I don't have uh, time yet to really uh, dealing with the specific things like the customs within this coming from where. But certainly the South China was the uh, the Chinese uh, the place where the Chinese uh, migrated to Southeast Asia, and that's for sure. The only thing that I can think in terms of reference is I know there's a new book just coming out from the University of Hawaii Press by this uh, scholars in Australia. Now I forget his name. Uh, uh, in fact, I was one of the reviewer of the book. Uh, but he, he might have some info, more information about that because the, his book is about the uh, Chinese, the introduction of Chinese culture from even back from 16th, 17th century to Java. I, if you send me your email, I can, uh, I have the book in, uh, here. I can uh, give you the name of the book. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, next question we have from uh, Ms. Lois Anderson, if you wanna jump on, Lois. Hi, Lois. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Where's, where, where are you? There's only <laughs> name. It's only name. <laughs> oh, I know. Okay. The host has asked you to start. Okay. All right. There we go. Okay. Anyway, I have about three questions. Uh, who is the leader of a Sakat and Gamelan? Is it the Bonang player? Mm -hmm. Why are both Gamelan tuned to pay? Log. Does that say something about the history? And third, how many? Oh, in Jokja, they also have uh, Sakat and Gunter Sari. Right. Yeah. Okay. So those are the questions. All right. The first question. Very interesting that there is no drum. I said that yeah. the book is not functioning as drum, which I don't have a good explanation why there is no drum. But the person who uh, of course, the introduction is, uh, is by the Punang. Yes. A long introduction, and then a, uh, the uh, piece start. Of course, the first and the second piece is standard, Rambu and Rangkong. Mm -hmm. And then after that, the first demung who decide what piece oh. to be performed on the spot. Well, it used to be on the spot, but nowadays probably they write it down on the black, uh, uh, on the blackboard uh, that the piece is keeping this, this, and that. But in the past, I think there is uh, they, they, uh, the first among decide what piece to, to be performed after the long introduction from the Punang. Okay. Uh, right. The second question, what, what was that? Paylog. Oh, the paylog. That's a good question. I don't think I have a, 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 any good answer, except if you want to fall into this uh, uh, debate about whether Cylindro is uh, 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 Pelock is older than Cylindro or Cylindro mm -hmm. older than Pelock, all of these things. Because yes. the, uh, as I don't remember Yap Kunz, I think so he thinks that Pelock is older than this oh, Cylindro or okay. uh, something like that. But, but, but it's, uh, it's a good question because a slindro is always attached on the wayang. You have a kender wayang in Bali and then oh, yeah. uh, a kender in wayang in Java is very important. Uh, but the, the pelok is uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not sure how to, uh, to, to answer your questions uh, in terms of determining why pelok is being used for the skaten. Perhaps, and this is my conjecture, um, because uh, in most cases, uh, I think uh, if you can, I can think of even Gamelan at Westerians, uh, the cylindro is smaller size than the pillow. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's one of the consideration, is it just, just guessing, but I don't mm -hmm. know. Uh, of course, or what else I, uh, the reason for it. Uh, what in the last question? Gunter, sorry. Right. That's one thing that I, 
uh, uh, let me, uh, uh, a problem with uh, the uh, the my uh, well uh, it, i didn't explain in the uh, scat and uh, in that video uh, about which uh, scat and this young being performed in that video it was the uh, south scat and uh -huh. south scat and is younger is uh, i think it's called kundur matu uh, yes that's from paku born on the fourth uh 18 19th century i think yeah but the kundur sari is in the north that's uh, believed to be the oldest oh from the 16 probably 16 17th century yeah and i think this has something to do with the splitting between jukja and solo Mm -hmm. That's why the Chukcha has a Kundur Sari as well. And uh, might be in the pair is uh, the, the second uh, pair, uh, the second ensemble is, is being made new, like uh, in the one in solo. So is the Sakatan festival only one in Jokja and only one in, in uh, solo? I, I, I have the have a Sakatan in Chirapuan. Uh -huh. With a different kind of ensemble, a smaller uh, size, not as large as this cotton in solo in Chukcha. Okay. I think that's the only one that I know of. I, of course, what is so interesting about uh, Cornet de Groot, uh, who uh, write a report about Gamelan in Grisse, he lists all of the instrument uh, of ensemb Gamelan ensemble existed in the 19th century in Gerse, and one of them is Sekaten. Wow. I don't know what kind of Sekaten. I went to Gerse to, to trace the existence of old Gamelan that the Groot reported, and mm -hmm. I have no luck to find them. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Um, yeah, I want to make a note too that yeah, Jogjanese Sakatan and, and uh, Solanese Sakatan sounds very different. Mm -hmm. um, I know Jody just recently posted um, an entire playlist of Jogjanese Sakatan on the Gamelan Lisser. Yeah. And I don't know the name of the playlist, but it's on YouTube, and there's some really amazing songs on there. Mm -hmm. And I think Keith Rollison, uh, if you if you follow the uh, video. Um, after the documentary watched, um, Keith Rollison documented several of the Solanese uh, uh, Sagatan uh, songs on there. So there's maybe 10 or so songs on there and you can take a listen to them. On that video, on, you're talking about the video? Yeah, the video. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you probably will see me playing the moon there. Very cool. <laughs> Okay, next question I have uh, from Usman Haq, who is uh, from Nusantara Arts. Thanks, Usman. You're up next. If you want to unmute and turn your video on. All right. Um, uh, thanks for coming. Thanks so much. Some, I had a, a question about a sign that was in the video that was on a building, and I'm looking at it on my other screen. So it's in Jawi script, and it's... Uh, and it's it's the shahada, but it's but it's before each phrase in the shahada, in the shahada, there's this word. It says it looks like asharas or isharas or something like that. And I tried looking that up, but it, you know nothing came up on Google. <laughs> and I was like, why is that there? What is that? What's that mean? And where does it come from? Uh, I guess that's that's my question. Why does it say? This word and for like well, yeah, I don't know where 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 you, did you find that? It was in it was in the video and the uh, the the subtitle on this. I I just I've just got it paused here so I can read huh. it. Make sure, I got it right. Huh, but it huh. says uh, Bangsalore, so I guess that's either the North Pavilion or somewhere around the north. There's just this banner uh, mm -hmm. above everyone's heads that says that says that it says like I guess Isharaz. Laila, and I don't know like what language it's from or yeah. what it means. It's the first time I've ever seen that right, right. before the, you know, in the Shahada. So I was like, um, 
I was just wondering if you had any ideas. <laughs> uh, no, I don't have. Uh, I don't have any reference. Uh, I will have to look for it first before I say anything. <laughs> sure. sure. Yeah, it's like a three forty. It's three minutes and forty-seven seconds in. Three minutes forty. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. The mystery continues. Thank yeah, you so yeah. much again. <laughs> okay. Next. It's definitely very important. Thanks, Usman. Uh, we have uh, Mark Perlman is up next. He has a question for Pat Marshall. All right. <laughs> Hello, Sumarsam. Yeah. Hi, Mark. How are you? Very good. I don't see myself. I don't know if anyone can see me, but... Yes, uh, I can see you. Okay. Um, so, uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, it's it's uh, so great to hear your voice again. Mm -hmm. And to, you know, be talking about these interesting questions. One thing that I always wondered about, uh, since the history of Gamelan, as we all know, is extremely mysterious, uh, and the stories that have come down to us, we don't know to what extent uh, they have a historical basis. Um, and so I always wondered about the, the idea that Sakaten is an old gamelan, or that it is, in, in any event, older than, you know, the sort of standard uh, gamelan kalenangan that we know of. And the reason why I wondered about that is because of the bonang and the way the bonang is played. Because it's built like um, our modern bonang, our familiar bonang, mm -hmm. uh, just very large. So large, in fact, obviously, that you had to, you have to kind of uh, uh, curl the, the far corners to bring the uh, extreme edge pitches in close enough to reach them. But, uh, but it's basically the same phenomenon that you have two parallel racks of, uh, of kettles but they're played by two different people. Yeah. Now, that always struck me as, as oddly kind of out, uh, uh, non-intuitive or out of sync somehow. Um, because if you essentially have two different parts being played, why make them you know, on the same rack? Why not separate them? Mm -hmm. um, so one possible speculation is that the, the Sakaten is simply, uh, you know, more or less the modern gamelan, but built extremely large. And we know that, as you pointed out, the, the gamelan uh, in solo that's in the North Pavilion, which is the older one, is the smaller one. And the one that was built by Papa Bono IV in the early 19th century, presumably, is larger. And so presumably the, the small one is one of a pair that was separated when the, when the kingdom of Mataram was split. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Jogja got one of them and Solo got the other. Though, as far as I know, those, those two today are not tuned the same. So that would be an interesting question to, to ask about. But then each kingdom in Solo and Georgia then built a replacement mm -hmm. to, so that they each would have a pair, uh, but they built it larger so that, uh, you know, there may have been this kind of gigantism, this gradual evolution uh, of, or, or maybe one-upsmanship or a kind of arms race you know, of, you know, who can build the bigger gamelan? The way in, in Solo we've seen who can build the bigger Pendopo, you know, has uh, gave us the Mankunagara and Pendopo and then the Tebe F Pendopo and so on. But um, so, you know, is it possible that the, you know, that the Bonang in Sakaten once was played like the modern Bonang, but then they kept building them larger and larger until it was impossible for one player to play both sides of it. And so they split it up and 
you know, essentially uh, created two different instruments in the one rack. Just a, you know, wild speculation. Right, right. Well, that, I think it's good speculation. So yeah, <laughs> it's always difficult to pin down the year when the scatting is being, uh, uh, being made. Uh, I once I actually uh, uh, have a good contact with Pais Kunander, who's the cultural attaché in DC uh, at this time, and he actually is the expert on chemistry. And I actually came to uh, uh, have a project with him uh, to uh, by way of analyzing the chemistry of the uh, scat and whether we can come up with uh, uh, the date of the making of the scat and, but it didn't happen yet. <laughs> uh, well, it's a, it's, as you said, it's a typical to pin down the creation of the Kamlan, the modern Kamlan when it's being uh, created. But it's certainly, if you think about this uh, Kamlan from Banten, the image that you saw, and also the Balinese Kamlan, the Punang, the Rayong, Trombong is only one rose. And whether that's to be considered as the older Punang is only one row that you can see from Bali up to Banten. And I, I guess the Kamlan Renteng in Cirebon also only one row. Uh, and in what, uh, what reasons uh, of that one rose then to be uh, 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 converted into two rows, Bunang, that's the question that, uh, that I don't have any answer uh, to that. Uh, uh, so, well, as, as you said, this is still uh, not sure how to, uh, to talk about the detailed history of, of all of this, whether... Uh, well, that's, yeah, that's exactly what my question is, because if it was really an old gamelan, then why isn't it like the 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 Gon Rente and the the the, the, um, the Bantanese uh, gamelan with the single row, right. like the the Rayong in in Bali or the Trompong, the single row Bonang, uh, and but the but the fact that it's the kind of modern double row Bonang always made me wonder. Mm. Thanks, Mark. This, yeah, oh, this is all, yeah, I just <laughs> start to think about all of the history now. And this has, it's so uh, similar to the, uh, to the gongs. If you think of the bronze drum from the, uh, 300 BCs, and then the from Dang Sun culture spread all over Southeast Asia, the, uh, the bronze drum is only have a one uh, head without knobs in the middle. Uh, it, when it came to Indonesia and in Bali, Sumatra, Java, and all over the place, the drums drums uh, has no function as musical instrument anymore, but as an uh, object for worship. But the bronze drums has no knobs. And then the gong, you have a knob. So there's another, uh, there's a, a mystery when there, whether there's a, any uh, evidence when this transition from knobless bronze drum to becoming a uh, uh, gong with knob without decoration like in Prince Sam. They just I'll throw you in there as a comparison how typical it is to try to paint down the uh, history of Kamlan. Thank you. Do you have time for a few more questions, Pastor Marsam? Yeah, one, one, one or two more. <laughs> one or two more? Okay, I think I have two more on here. So uh, the first one is uh, from Dionysius, if you'd like to jump in. <clears throat> Hi, uh, thank you so much for the lecture. I'm, I'm Gion, I'm from Jogja, oh. studying in Bennington College now. Uh, I'm wondering when you talk about Rosa, I'm wondering if uh, when you talk about a uh, relation with, uh, of Java and India as well, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if like there's any difference in how 
Rosa, Rosa is understood in India and Java. And I'm wondering if uh, Rosa is also understood differently in different uh, parts of Indonesia, because I first understood the concept from my family in Bali. So I'm, I'm wondering, what, what do you think about that, if there's differences? <laughs> Well, that, that's a, a big question <laughs> because in a way it's so typical even to pin down what Rosso is. Uh, uh, I just uh, make a, uh, uh, an ex expanded uh, explanation uh, about Masmiti's uh, lectures uh, of the intimate relationship between Rosso and the model mood progression in the Wayang performance from uh, uh, Patat Nam, Patat Songo, and Patat Manjuro. And uh, uh, at this time, I'm actually reading this uh, very fascinating uh, article by the Dutch scholar Amri Kompert, who uh, identified the uh, uh, possible connection between uh, rasa as the way how uh, Natya Sastra, the ancient uh, book on dance and performing art in India, uh, described this uh, mood progression as the same similar kind of thing that happening in the Wayang performance. So that's, uh, that's a very highly uh, speculative uh, 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 study on this because of course there is no recording from <laughs> 9, 10, 11, 12 centuries but uh, uh, people really, scholars really want to know more about the connection between India and Java in this matter of what kind of uh, influences uh, in performing art and uh, all sorts of things. Uh, another question, of course, is Wayang, whether Wayang actually originated from India or from China or actually indigenous Japanese. So that's a big uh, topic and people has, uh, don't have any uh, the same agreement in what way how to explain that topic. Uh, now, uh, well, I don't know what else I should say. Uh, because it's, 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 it's certainly a piece of music, a gandeng. Uh, uh, you can think of one particular, particular gandeng has a particular rasa and particular mood, particular mood. I was connecting mood and mood in the same way. Uh, but then there's also gandeng who uh, 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 make a pro uh, make a progression from uh, dignified rasa to more lively rasa in the same piece with, uh, in different irama and so on and so forth. I happen to just uh, publish an article on the uh, irama, um, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the temporal intensity flow in Japanese gamelan uh, just published a couple of months ago in this uh, 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 collection of uh, a book of collection of uh, rhythms. Uh, so that's I, I, I you can think uh, that book I explained of uh, this uh, transition from one section to another uh, what the Irama has something to do with the rasa. Yeah. Well, um, this is a, a, a big, uh, a, a good topic, but yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. I have one last question uh, from uh, Jody Diamond, if you want to jump in, Jody. Right. Um, I'm happy to yield to the next person. Why don't you go ahead? I think you might be, you may have been the last one. The last one? Yeah, I think you were the last one on there. So <laughs> oh. you're no oh. one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, Pax and Marsan, first of all, thank you so much. And I would love to get the uh, title of that book. Which book? Uh, the one you said you just published an article about Irama. 
Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I, yeah. It, it, Rama just fascinates me, and it's, I, I try to think how it was invented. Do you, do you know anything about that? I mean, I imagine the musicians are playing, and they say, oh, I know, let's, let's slow down, and we could play twice as many notes. Oh, but wait, let's not slow down exactly twice as much. <laughs> so when we play twice as many notes, it's a little faster than the notes we were playing before. I mean, what a brilliant idea. Yeah. And how did that happen? That's, I would love to know yeah. that. I, I explained a little bit on the aspect of composing in which one? In my first book, I think, it was a bit, I always think of a composer, a composer piece in particular, Irama. And then whether it's the speed up or slow down, that will be coming later on. Uh, the best example, which is I explained in my first book, was Pankor. And Pankor actually was not composed from uh, in Irama 1, but actually it's in Irama 3. And then you can speed up from Irama 2 and 1. Yeah. See? And Pankor, of course, is motor part. And so so it's a it's a I guess it's a sort of a, a playing with time. Uh, start with a particular identifiable space, and then you can think of uh, how to make it more interesting with, to, to speed up or to slow down uh, in Irama Rankap in such way that people, uh, season has a good time when they playing in Irama Rankap. Uh, right. And do so many that, that makes a lot of sense because when you play Pankor, it's like, okay, tango and quick, quick, let's get done with that. And Dados, oh, uh, yeah, all right, all right. Ah, oh, when you finally get to Will It and you have the tango, the, um, you know, the mocha pot kind of more full, yeah, then it really feels like it's Pankor. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right, thanks. Hey, all right. Uh, I think that's all the time we have for. Um, I want to say, an, a, again, an extreme thank you to Pasumar Sam for joining us today. It's been an awesome lecture. Uh, this is going to be uh, uploaded to the YouTube channel probably in the next day or two, and um, as well as any previous ones that weren't uploaded. Um, and if you have the ability to please give a donation to the Gamelan uh, Artist to Artist Fund, please go to New Centaur Arts website and do so. Every little bit counts. Um, and it's on the page for the speaking series. So thank you, Pop Marsam. It's been wonderful. And uh, yeah, thank you again. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. Anytime. Anytime. All right. Take care, everybody. <laughs>